here is one I just really wanted to see and be involved in how UX is developing here, but also I'm really interested in understanding uh, women and work in India because I know all about the US uh, cultural experience of working in, the, in, in a corporation, but I do not claim to know anything about being in India and working here. So, um, so my perspective today is very much from the US perspective, um, and my research was done, done while I was uh, in Seattle. So um, I'd be really happy to hear your points of view of what, you, what sounds about the same and what's, what would be different. Um, in, from an Indian perspective. So, is your product gender neutral? This, uh, as I said, I worked at Microsoft for 17 years in uh, user experience, and I got to work with a variety of teams, but obviously, what I started to realize, the teams were very uh, male dominant, and the question was not so much about how women work. It was trying to take a business perspective of, we talk a lot about you know, the need for diversity, but what does that really mean and how does it translate into business? So, first of all, let's look at why it matters. Quick history lesson, won't bore you with the details, but way, way, way back, um, there were centralized mainframe computers. You had to go to a room where a computer was. It was huge. It did just a few things. It didn't matter whether you're male, female, old or young. The computer was designed just to do one thing, no variation, no customization. Next, personal computers in the 90s. They were very much based on um, office-based tasks, word processing, spreadsheets, still not much customization, personalization, doesn't matter who you are, the tasks were pretty similar. Moving on, modern day. Now we're looking at mobile uh, computing, social computing, um, internet of things. It is becoming more and more integrated into our lives, into how we move around, and that means that all those differences that we know exist, um, or have guesses around gender or age, and really start to show up in how we should be designing technologies. So the future is, it's absolutely everywhere. It's in medicine, health, transportation, um, robots helping out. I mean, it's, it's going everywhere. So there's no stopping this. We need to be paying attention. So who makes the products? This is how a development team often looks. This is a generous slide of saying, well, maybe it's 20% women and 80% um, men. Most of the teams I've worked on while I was at Microsoft were actually different. It was more like 90% men and 10% women. So the question I put to some people when I was interviewing them was, so can a development team that looks like this, 10% women, 90% men, really develop gender neutral products that are meant to be for half men, half women? Like, can that really happen? And what actually happened was when I asked people this question, men and women, the first thing women said was, yeah, no, of course they can't. Like, and they listed a bunch of examples as to where decision making was different. When I asked the guys, they were like, huh, now you've mentioned it, I don't suppose, we, they're like, huh, there must be some problems with this. So it was just interesting even raising it as, an, as a talking point. So my fear of the future, if we don't really think this through, is the first robot out there that will be able to sort of be able to do anything of value will be one that can kind of just shoot a snooker ball and, and hang out with the guys, which is often like the first scenarios that get developed for uh, technology. So before I go into sort of uh, the development cycle and show you the differences, um, I'm just going to point out some differences, and you must all be sitting there going, yeah, you know all about gender differences. Because after all, you're either a female or a male, and you know where you differ. But first of all, let's just look at hands. So when there is a huge amount of measurement data out there, anthropometrics, it's been out there for ages, for since like the 50s. So every body part is measured. So that when you're designing furniture, technology, tables, buildings, environments, you can use this information to really, hey, know what, what percentage of the population you're dealing with. The hand one is interesting. Um, 
partly because it relates to a lot of handheld products. But today, um, I'm, I'm a fairly tall female. In fact, I'm sort of like 95th, 99th percentile. So I am really in that tall female category. Um, and hand, this, this measurement here, I am um, also in the 90th. This information has been available for ages. So good hardware companies will think this through and look at um, anthropometrics. So that's a real measurement one. And our lifestyles are different. The research showing that women like to shop and men buy. And what that is, is men like to have a list, know what they're going to go get. They go into the store, they find the items, they pay for the items, and they go. Women kind of know what they want to buy, but they want an experience. They want to go in, they want to look around, they want to like compare choices, they want support and assistance. Same task, different. Um, levels of satisfaction with different approaches. Some companies now in the US, um, hardware stores with building supplies and uh, wallpaper, paints and tools, they've redesigned themselves because they realize more women now are buying that stuff. And so rather than just rows and rows of like, hey, you want, you know, you need a drill, you need a hammer, you need whatever, they're trying to actually make it more experience based. Next one, lifestyles are different. Women do twice as much housework as men. And again, this is a US-based study. I don't know what the numbers would be like here. Um, which consequently means less sleep and less leisure time. And so again, when you're designing products, hey, this would be fun to do, or this will like, take the stress out of life, is, well, OK, which gender are you thinking about? How can you really think about both perspectives and the needs of both? And so this is all about just being really open-minded and considering uh, deliberately considering both perspectives. And then the last one is, this was a study uh, done through MIT, was women worry about different things in, when anticipating retirement. So women are worrying about inflation for, for how much money they have available, longevity, how old will I be, women tend to live a long time, and health, healthcare. In this survey, the thing that men outrated women on about worrying about Will I be bored? <laughs> okay? And there's nothing wrong, like, honestly, nothing wrong. This is the way, you know, the way things are. I'm not going to try and change it and, like, force men into worrying about these other things. It's purely, hey, there are differences in lifestyles. Consider it. Think it through. Uh, technology use is different. Um, and so is it, like, Twitter. Women actually have say more in their tweets. Men tend to link and point to things. Um, bloggers in the US used to be predominantly female because they just write and persist and write longer, whereas the top bloggers used to be men. And developing those technologies, they always used to think they were male bloggers, but actually it really wasn't that way. Um, buying power. In the US, nearly all the buying power now is actually with the women. Whether they're actually, uh, like, I, I don't have the numbers here in terms of how much is truly, you know, they earn, they pay for, but they influence all the decisions. Um, house, car, health insurance, all the big decisions. So, hey, pay attention, businesses. This is what you need to be looking at. So, the next thing I was asking about was personal opinion. Again, if we've got the men and women coming to work, 90% men, 10% women, how does your personal opinion come in at work? So most companies like to say, hey, we have these processes. It's not about opinions, it's about data. We really think this through. It's we think about customers, we think about the business and the numbers and the money we're making, we think about the technology, and that's how we make decisions. Then as we move through the cycle, we're making trade-offs about whether we want to ship the product, the quality. You know, we have processes in place. Hands up who works with a product team of some kind. Okay, quite a lot of you. Now, how many times do you go to work and somebody's got to make a quick decision? Is it like it's fairly frequent, right? It's decisions are made constantly. There is a general process, but we make decisions all the time. And how we make that decision is based on our gut responses and what we know. So does personal opinion influence that gut decision making? And when I asked everybody, I talked to people of different job disciplines, different level, senior and junior, and uh, male and female? And the answer is yes. 
They bring personal opinion to decision making, both men and women. Except the only discipline I could not get to say, yes, they brought opinion, were researchers, market researchers, user researchers. I sat on them and I squeezed them and I'm like, come on, like, confess, you do, you do, and it was like, there was no way of making them crack. Um, they, want, they generally try and stay with their data because their credibility is based on representing customer data, user data, and numbers. But everybody else, hey, designers in the room, sorry, they confessed, personal opinion came in. So decisions for personal, if you're using it. Personal gain, I really want this feature in the product, please put it in, I really, really need it. Enthusiasm and bragging rights, hey, we're gonna beat the competition, we have this, we do this faster, we're better. And opportunity to learn, you know, when you've just learned that new skill and you're looking for a way of applying it, we all do it, How, you know. So if you put that feature in, I get to use that new um, HTML5 widgety thing, and so let's do that. So does gender influence opinion? And the answer is yes. It influences it, it in a way because women do not like to share feminine opinions. So even though you're putting, you know, you, you've, the companies are valuing having diversity in a room, it's very hard to get women to really share all their opinions. And the reasons for this is I don't want to raise any opinion that will identify me as a woman in the room. It just, that's a topic that they really often will, uh, they just don't want to be called out as different in some way. So they'd sooner not mention the things like, hey, I really like shopping as opposed to like, yeah, you have a list, you buy stuff off it. Second one was, I don't want to suggest any ideas that will be voted down later. Like, who wants to put the loser idea out there? And so, don't want to be identified as a woman because I don't want to put the idea out because, you know, I'll be shot down. And the final one is, the sad one sometimes is, when you've worked in a company for a while, it's, I've forgotten I'm a woman. I don't even think to bring those issues into the room. And so, so we need to do something about that to enable this voice because, again, companies need that perspective. When they're building products, so when they go out of the door, at the beginning, they will be successful with men and women. And again, if you're a business, you kind of want that. So let's look at the engineering process. Um, because it was like, okay, now I know this. Where does it show up? And where does opinion show up actually in this process? And so I went, again, when I'm talking to people, it's like, let's go through the cycle. And this is just a representation. It can be agile, it can be waterfall, it can be Six Sigma. Again, personal opinion comes into it all. So, one is at the concept phase, you've got the brainstorming and voting on ideas. Well, as we heard this morning on the panel, that sometimes when you raise your voice uh, with an idea, it can really be stamped on and sort of pushed out of the way. It's really hard to really open up. So brainstorming is an area that, hey, yeah, it's great, everybody idea on the table and, or on the post-it notes on the wall. It doesn't always work that way if it's not a really empowered environment. Another one that is very common for startups and also in corporations is the concept of an idea. You'll go pitch an idea. Now, the people that buy off are uh, venture capitalists and investors. And today, in the US, they're mostly men. When you're pitching an idea, you try and desperately appeal to them and um, get them to like you, to like the idea. And you do that by sometimes customizing the um, prototype you're putting forwards. And so then it can lead to a more male-oriented uh, prototype. This was just an example, and I'll go through it quickly because I know I've got to watch the time. Was, it was just a prototype, uh, not a prototype, it was an early uh, product for a finance product developed by like five guys. When I saw the trailer for the promotion, it's like, oh, guy coming home from work, runs into a house, kids are screaming, kettle is, you know, steaming over. Like, next thing, he's really sad because, you know, everything's going on and he's got bills to pay. And now he's really worried now, I don't know if this is single dad or they just totally forgot to put the woman in the picture or whether she's coming home. Because again, in the US, women take care of the finances. Um, and then they looked at the categories for making a budget with this product, and the samples were home, movies, holiday gifts, gas parking, bars and good times, 
uh, business, food, and games. And it's like, okay, you know, I'm not sure whether this is a gender diverse kind of uh, first example product to put out there. Okay, I'm just going to skip this example. Timing. So we've got early development. We look at scorecards, bug counts, and feature sets. Those are the formal processes of when you're developing a product. But the chances are, personal opinion, loud voices, and your own priorities are coming into the decision making. Or people are using their personal data sets to start the code off. Or they'll start with a scenario to support that they really want. And the question is, how do you get diversity um, involved in that aspect of decision making? And at the end of the release cycle, we've got lots of examples around um, beta testing and pre-release. Often it's men that do, do the early adoption of products, which means the data you're getting back, not just bug fixes, but scenarios and ideas for the next version, it's heavier on male scenarios than getting the feedback from uh, women. So here are some examples of cost-nothing um, improvements for engineering teams. One is always refer to the user as a she. Doesn't matter what product you're developing, whether it's an IT product, developer product, uh, home product, is if you start calling the user a she, it will start to make a difference and not end up with a he and it's a me scenario. Exec should always ask for females in prototypes to help get rid of the idea of that they customize for the male audience. Simple one is put gender on any data slides, help understand and be aware. It's all about informed design. Um, then on small efforts, this one I love to poke teams with is, again, if it's a product, it's good for men and women. And they're like, okay, yeah, there's no, there should be no differences. It's, you know, it's good for everyone. And then as soon as you say to them, okay, well then, if we do any research, it should only be with women. You know, they go, well, no, that can't be right. Because, um, you know, because they're, it's like, so you think there are differences? And they're like, well, yeah. So the question is either do research with only women if you tell me there is no difference because you shouldn't be afraid of that, um, or you do uh, something else and I got zero. Um, okay, I'm gonna, oh, screw it, I'm gonna go for an extra minute. <laughs> um, we've got uh, uh, brainstorming. Make sure you have more women in the room. Have a women-only brainstorming session. I don't know if the answers will be different, but you, that's how you enable it, and then check to see what's the same and what's different. These are ideas. The last one is uh, just think about women as early adopter panels. And the footnote here is I often give this talk L, uh, to a variety of teams, including engineering teams, and it's, hey, really empower your user experience teams. Really pay attention to customer-focused design. That's what it really should be about. But in the meantime, when you're making thousands of decisions, make sure you pay attention to gender. So I have a research paper on this at this URL. So if you want to know more and hear more examples, that's where they are. Okay, I'm, there, there you go, now I'll respect the zero. Thank you.